Thank you for joining us for this discussion on modernizing benefits for the 21st century. I'm Alastair Fitzpain, Executive Director of the Future Work uh, Initiative at the Aspen Institute. These conversations are part of an ongoing global inclusive recovery and rebuilding series, which will explore what it will take to drive a global and inclusive recovery for all. This series is part of the Global Inclusive Growth Partnership, a collaboration between the Aspen Institute and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. I'm honored to be joined by Congresswoman Susan Del Benning, who is a leading voice on modernizing benefit systems in the United States. Congresswoman, thank you for joining us. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Uh, COVID-19 is um, first and foremost a public health crisis and you know about that um, acutely um, given your, the experience you've had in your district. It's upended the labor market, it's coined a new term around essential workers, and ushered in an era of remote work. But I just wanted to start our conversation by asking you how you think the future of work and the conversation around it has changed due to COVID-19. Well, first, I think it's really highlighted the disparities in our systems of benefits. I mean, no one really thought of a scenario where everyone would be impacted so quickly at the same time, the impact of a public health crisis shutting things down um, immediately, the need for safety, for personal protective equipment, all of the all of the resources that were required and the impact it was gonna have on so many workers. Um, before the pandemic, we had many, many workers who were temporary or contract on-demand type workers. And the pandemic has really highlighted how folks in those positions were left out in terms of the safety net and the resources that we have available. So I think not only from a health standpoint and a specifically a public health standpoint, understanding um, what we need to have in place so resources are available so that people can be safe, but also understanding uh, the, the disparities that already existed and kind of that are laid bare as a result of the pandemic and what we need to do to address those in the future. Yeah, well, let me just pick up on that. And you talked about the disparities and we're in a public health crisis. I guess, how has um, COVID and its impact, you know, changed your thinking around kind of benefits that are important to um, health, whether it's, you know, healthcare insurance, paid leave, paid uh, family leave, um, and paid sick leave. Has, has your thinking changed around the, you know, relative importance of those types of benefits? Well, I think I have always felt, and I think we all feel that it's critically important that people always have um, health care, affordable quality health care, period. Um, that's been critically important and not only not only coverage, but also access. Um, so that's something that we continually need to make sure we're working on. And in a crisis, especially when many people have health care that is associated with their employment, um, losing a job has huge impacts in terms of economic viability, but, um, and, it, and if you don't have the resources to cover something like COBRA, et cetera, that also highlights the, the challenges that we have in benefits. Um, and so paid leave, clearly, if you have to take time off or stop working, how do you have coverage there, access to unemployment insurance, all of these are critically important, especially during a national crisis. So uh, we have to look at where not only workforce is now, but where it's headed. I think we've been behind in making sure we update our benefit models to deal with the way the world works today, let alone with the way the world it will be working in the future. And so we've tried some things to try to catch up momentarily during this crisis. I think we've got to look long term and there's a huge sense of urgency. We should have a huge sense of urgency around this, around um, making sure that we have programs in place going forward that will anticipate these types of scenarios and others um, so that we don't have these disparities and gaps that we saw at the beginning of this pandemic. Yeah, well, let me ask you um, a follow-up question to that because you mentioned, you know, obviously we need to have the programs that are necessary to respond to the challenges that we're all experiencing. And it raises an important question about how you see the role of employers and what they should be doing in this moment to respond to these challenges and then the role of government. So I would love to hear your thoughts a bit on what you think employers should be responsible to do and kind of to meet this 
moment and kind of the longer term challenges and then what you think um, government should do. And obviously there's going to be, you know, some interplay between those, uh, you know, kind of institutional actors. So I would love to hear your thoughts on how you think about the relative balance between employers and government. Well, um, first, we know when the pandemic hit that gig workers, contract workers, self-employed were particularly vulnerable because they live outside of what we think of as the standard safety net that is built around a traditional employer-employee relationship. And so I think we first have to identify that that employer-employee relationship is very different. What one employer might provide for workers may be very different than what another employer would provide. And so I would say the employer in your context here um, may not always be the same thing for every worker. And we have to highlight that and make sure that we cover all of those scenarios. So, um, so in order to make sure that we have those um, benefits available, I think it's a combination of work for the government as well as the private sector to understand um, how do we make sure that in every scenario benefits are available, paid leave, make sure that everyone has health care, make sure that um, we have, uh, have resources that are available for folks um, and loss of employment. So I do think it's a combined effort because we are built on a model, a traditional model that doesn't cover everyone, which means we have to update those models, take these gaps into, into consideration. Um, and there, we knew that this was a problem before, um, but clearly the urgency of the pandemic has, has kind of heightened how quickly we need to move. So I'd say uh, the, the federal government needs to come in like we did in providing unemployment insurance um, and unemployment benefits for workers who wouldn't normally qualify in relief packages that we put together. But this shouldn't be emergency legislation. We've got to address this for the long term. Yeah, and I want to come back to the question around what to do for gig workers and UI in the longer term, but I did want to pick up on this question of what the uh, federal government should do versus what state governments um, can do. And you're from Washington, and Washington has been a leader on a lot of these uh, benefit issues and has a paid leave program that they've recently um, uh, implemented and begun to, to run. But I'm curious, how do you think about what the federal government should do and versus kind of what the state government um, should do um, when it comes to some of these important questions around, around benefits? Well, we've been, um, we've definitely been using state and local government as laboratories for what are the, the best policies to put in place. And I think that is going to be critically important going forward. That's why we've put forward legislation to make sure we have more pilot programs to understand what works and what doesn't work and why um, the scenarios, because those can inform not only local legislation, but federal legislation. Um, we, we can look at something like paid leave where we've had um, states take action individually like Washington State. Um, we, still don't it was, we still don't have paid leave available to every worker across the country. So I do think there is an important federal law, role to be pl played there. We put um, paid leave in the relief packages that we put forward like the HEROES Act that's passed the House. But um, we need long-term coverage, um, something like the Family Act that um, we've been looking at in the House. And those, that type of policy, I think, would work in conjunction with state policy. So it's not one or the other. I think there's a possibility for there to be federal legislation that works in conjunction to the states to make sure that we have coverage for everyone. In some places, that might be enhanced coverage. Um, but states really have been leading the way in putting these programs together. And that learning is gonna be very important to inform federal legislation. Yeah, that's um, interesting. Now, I, I definitely wanna go back to this question of what to do for gig workers as it relates to unemployment insurance. We have close to 30 million people who are on unemployment insurance. Um, a huge number of, of, of those are non-traditional workers, gig workers, self-employed, independent contractors. Um, and the question I think for policymakers is, you know, will what we have seen um, in the pandemic be a model for a longer term reform? How are you thinking about potentially changing unemployment insurance to permanently make it available to gig workers? And do you think that's something that um, can or will happen in 2021? 
Um, well, the federal unemployment benefit really was a lifeline for so many workers and families, um, but it also showed how behind we are in provide in looking at these benefits. So um, that's why with Senator Warner, um, we developed a proposal to bring these systems, these state unemployment insurance systems up to date um, by giving states the resources they need to cover their added administrative costs that they've incurred from trying to modernize state unemployment um, insurance system technology. We saw many states struggle um, because they were trying to, we can talk about a benefit in a piece of legislation, but actually implementing it, um, getting resources out to people is much more difficult. And we need to take the learnings that we have from the, what's been put in place during the pandemic and make sure that we implement those for the long, the long run, um, that we are looking at how we modernize those systems, that we provide resources, um, that we provide funding to help states um, to make their systems up to date. And also to connect systems, because we know that um, uh, states don't always target workers that might likely become long-term unemployed. Um, we want to be able to ta target them for additional services or programs that might be available to them. And so part of updating systems is also making sure that integration is there. Um, I think two thirds of states have never updated their profiling models. Um, so many things were developed decades ago. And so we want to make sure that we have resources out there to help states update these systems, which is why we put together our proposal. Um. Let me ask you about another massive challenge facing Congress, and that's how to help the millions of workers who are permanently losing their jobs. I'm sure you have um, constituents who work in the leisure and hospitality industry and are facing the prospect of not being able to return um, to their previous job. Uh, as you know, US government doesn't really spend much on retraining programs. Many people don't have the resources to go back to uh, a college, whether it's a two-year degree or a four-year degree. I guess when it comes to this um, question about how to help people transition to new jobs, how are you thinking about what Congress can do there to help people make these transitions? Well, this is an issue also that's predated the pandemic and has been highlighted by the pandemic um, as we see changes in um, in our economy and changes in work, we need to make sure that skills are available. And we kind of have a model built on, you get trained for something and then you're set and, um, and you go about your career. And we know that it's not, people might get training at work, but we also know that some people are gonna have to make more significant changes and may not be able to um, learn at work because they may not um, be able to keep that same job or the career they in may not have a, a lot of long-term viability in a new economy. So I introduced a lifelong learning and training account um, piece of legislation so that we could give workers a benefit, a portable um, government match savings account for lifelong learning. So they would contribute to that, um, th that would, those resources would be available to them to um, help learn new skills, to update their skills, to keep in a place where they um, are in a viable place in the current job market. Um, I do think that that would also assist people who are low and moderate income, um, who want to retrain, um, may not necessarily have that given to them through their job. Um, so this would help them through the course of their careers have a benefit that's available to them. Um, that's clearly one thing we need to do. We also need to look at how we provide that training, um, making sure that, for example, our community colleges have up-to-date technologies, their training based on the way things work today, not a yesterday, um, so that those skills are the, the skills that you need actively to be able to get into a job. We look at credentials, um, things that can be done in a short-term way, not necessarily an entire new degree. All of those things, I think, comprehensively are things we need to look at to help address the changing workforce and the need to keep skills um, updated. Yeah, well, Congressman, I think that's the, um, a great way to um, wrap up our conversation. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today, and uh, I wish we had more time, um, but we'll have to leave it there. You've given us a lot to, to think about and um, uh, reasons to be optimistic about what the future of work holds. So uh, thank you again.
No, thank you. I look forward to working to, to continue to move forward on these issues. So thanks for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. And now I'll turn to Sarika Abbey, Associate Director of the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program for an overview of how we at the Aspen Institute are collaborating with the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth to reimagine benefits for the 21st century. Thank you, Alan, Congresswoman Dalbeni. That conversation really highlighted how broken and inequitable our system of benefits is and how disparities in our system, which at its core was not designed equitably, were really laid front and center for all to see and many to experience in this pandemic. At the Aspen Institute, we recently released a paper, A Modernized System of Benefits is the Foundation for an Inclusive Economy, launching our new initiative, Benefits 21, in partnership with the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. And while the idea for this initiative came together prior to the pandemic, the pandemic has highlighted the urgency to reimagine and create a modernized system of benefits that ensures inclusive recovery from this pandemic, resilience to future ones, and opportunities for all workers to prosper. And in an economy today, where over half of workers who lost their job in the early months of COVID-19 still don't have one, where over 850,000 women left the workforce just last month, and where as the economy recovers, not all jobs will, we need to reimagine how we build a system that values all households in America and effectively supports them. Benefits 21 is therefore grounded in what all workers in our country need to be financially secure and the foundational role benefits play in ensuring that security. The reality is everyone in this country needs benefits to stabilize and thrive, but we all don't have equitable access. In the workplace, workers who don't have paid sick leave are forced to choose between taking care of their health or the health of a loved one and a day of lost wages and how that impacts their ability to make ends meet. Workers don't have access to retirement plans to build savings and accumulate wealth to pass on to future generations. And workers don't have access to health insurance. And even when they do, when it's tied to their workplace, they risk a lack of coverage in a pandemic and the fear and stress of the mounting debt they might accumulate if they get sick. And workers who are left out of workplace benefits often rely on a fragmented, complex system of public benefits that don't effectively meet their needs and also strip them of their dignity in the process. With Benefits 21, we recognize the importance of stepping away from our current system of benefits and what in our country is considered, or for that matter, not considered a benefit, to reimagine how we create a new system centered around what workers and their households need to ensure their financial security. We will focus on designing this system with and for those who are typically marginalized and persistently left out, including low-wage workers, workers of color, and workers in non-traditional work arrangements. And we will design it with the economic dignity of all workers in mind, with a strong belief that all workers and households deserve the economic capacity to care for family, the ability to pursue opportunity, and the right to work and participate in the economy with respect. To reimagine our system of benefits, Benefits 21 is taking a holistic approach to create an integrated system of benefits removing the fragmentation within and across our publicly and privately offered benefits, and recognizing the changing nature and future of work in this country, a need for portability of benefits, so benefits reside with workers and not their employers. To ensure all workers have financial security and can live economically dignified lives requires the design and delivery of a system of benefits guided by four key principles. Workers in America need and deserve an integrated system of benefits that is inclusive to protect all workers, people-centric with workers and their voices central to the design and delivery, portable to ensure continued access and funding during periods of transition, and interoperable using technology to integrate benefit systems and ensure seamless and effective access. With a framework of financial security and evidence-based approach, and design principles to guide us, we will determine the core bundle of benefits 
that ensure all households can stabilize in the short term and build towards financial security and economic mobility in the long term. This is an ambitious initiative and we have engaged multiple experts, thought leaders, innovators, and influencers across public, private, and portable benefits as part of our leadership advisory group to roll up their sleeves with us to help create a vision of a modernized system of benefits, converge around these core bundle of benefits, and develop a roadmap to create and sustain this new system. And we hope to engage all of you on this journey with us as supporters, shapers, and implementers to help activate marketplace innovation and policy solutions to create the change we need to ensure all workers can prosper. We know that all parties in this ecosystem, government, nonprofits, and private actors play a critical role to ensure the design and delivery of a system of benefits that supports inclusive, equitable growth. Thank you. I will now turn it to my colleague, Joanna smith Ramani, the Managing Director of the Aspen Institute's Financial Security Program, to lead a panel of experts who we feel grateful to have as thought partners in this work to discuss their vision for a modernized system of benefits and why this deeply matters to them. All right, well, welcome everyone. We're now in the next segment of this event on how to really think about what is the 21st century set of benefits America's workers need to thrive and to really achieve the kind of economic dignity they deserve. And I cannot even begin to tell you how excited I am for this panel that we have put together, um, all of which are represented and on actively work with us on our Benefits 21 work, including on our leadership advisory group. Um, but I have for us today, Bill Spriggs, professor and former chair of the Department of Economics at Howard University and the chief economist to the AFL-CIO, Trent Bigelow, who is the CEO and co-founder at TRAC, Molly Hemstreet, who is an executive co-director of the Industrial Commons, and Parag Mehta, the executive director and senior vice president for MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Now this power foursome is gonna have a chat with me, not just about what specifically we need to see in the country around the world of benefits, but the why. You know, why are they spending day in and day out on these issues? How have their careers got them here? And what do we think the world will look like when we do this? Like, let's imagine an amazing different country where workers have the economic security they work so hard for, and let's make it happen. So then let's get specific about it. All right, everyone, are we ready to dig into what I consider to be the topic of not just the year, I think the topic of the decade, really. We've got to solve this. Everyone ready with me? Ready. All sure. right, good, good, good. And we are, we are all over the country. We have Molly in North Carolina, correct? Um, Trent, where are you calling in from? San Francisco. San Francisco. Parag, are you in New York? I'm right now in Temple, Texas. Okay, even different than I thought. <laughs> and Bill, you already, I already snooped that you're in Northern Virginia, is that I correct? I am in Northern Virginia, that's correct. Okay, and I am in my home, as you can see, in Silver Spring, Maryland. So we are all over the country uh, in different kinds of communities, all of which are struggling right now. And I'm just gonna like, let's get into it. And I'll start with Molly. Tell me a little bit about what benefits mean to you and, and tell us in that, where you're working and what you're doing, how that plays in. Sure, and thank you so much for this opportunity to, to have this important discussion at this time and then also to lift up, particularly the, the voice I wanna to bring to the table is the smaller business and the rural communities um, that, are, that we're working here with here in North Carolina. So I think when we think about benefits, um, it's really about this moving beyond just a job into a livelihood that really can bring about the dignity of a person um, and um, it's also interesting, I think, in our contextually where we are, I mean, we're in a, a state where there's not a lot of unionization, unfortunately, there's a lot of manufacturing, these are very hard jobs. Um, these are traditionally, you know, we're in the rural south, these are traditionally sometimes jobs that aren't paid very well. So I think we're thinking about how do we figure out this bridge of just the necessity, the, what's needed out there to help jobs go from, you know, 
jobs to true livelihoods to high quality jobs. So we're interested in how we're pooling that for the small businesses that we're working with. We have some interesting models we can talk a little bit about now or down the road too about just how we're helping small businesses come together to build associations in which we can build out benefits, not only for the, 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 um, in, the business itself, because often the health of the business translates then therefore to the health of the worker. So we do a lot of support around supporting the small business so that the small business can therefore provide really good support for the worker. But then we're also looking at really the importance of the structure of the business. So many of the structures of the business and the small businesses are structured so there's employees benefits not beyond just a good wage, but structurally so that there are profit sharings. There's profit sharing or there's even um, ownership down the road for the employees as well. So for me, I'd like us to go beyond just the um, benefit package and to the actual yeah. structural of the business so that that's an opportunity if a business is being built with the energy um, of a worker as well. That's right. I love this. And what you're bringing up also is something that's so important to us in Benefits 21, which is not the, in addition to the traditional benefits, we think about retirement, health care, paid leave. There's a bigger world of what workers need for financial security, right? And in this this reimagining, and not just imagining, but really doing, like taking our imaginations, challenging ourselves, really pushing the limits of how creative we can be to then actual real action and change in the country. Can we really rethink what it is? What is the cocktail of kinds of benefits, lowercase d, not capital B, right, that actually workers need? And you're bringing that up and bringing up the institutions that are involved. So I, I love what you're already contributing and appreciate that. I'm going to turn to you because you're you're directly in contact with a, a different kind of worker. Um, and you're, I mean, I shouldn't say you're worker focused. Molly obviously is too, but she's thinking about how to build a kind of institution to best serve and include the worker and the worker voice. Describe what the work you're doing and how that brings you to benefits and, and what you think is important in that. So our team at Track, our kind of our viewpoint is really to be the advocate on behalf of independent workers in America. Uh, I think that we have become convinced that the, the way that we can uh, be able to serve and secure as many independent workers as possible is to actually partner with the apps and the platforms uh, that freelancers, independent workers, very small business owners either use, like say accounting software, all the way through where they earn work like in marketplaces. Um, the one thing that they don't get really from any of those, uh, those, those tools and those platforms are access to benefits. And I think what we'll get into today is, is talking about how it, that the, the traditions I think we've had in this country, uh, which are kind of eroding around safety nets for people, have really been felt very acutely by the person who is, quote, their own boss, whether they are a small business owner or they're a, a, a driver, say, for Uber. That's fantastic. And there's debate over how, how big that market is, but it moves. And it's still a, a percentage of workers that need us to think deeply about it. And it is, you know, again, the changing nature of work that we're seeing where you have more independent workers or small businesses, you know, as you're saying. So really interesting. I can't wait to dig deeper into, especially I'm, I'm curious from your end, what are, in this reimagining what are the benefits? What are the things that you're seeing people hear and say they need, those of us who care about this to actually be considering and thinking about? Bill, you're an economist, and you spent quite a bit of time thinking about these issues, and I'm wondering, can you give us at a higher level about what does this mean at a country level when we are not seeing the kinds of benefits that actually bring financial security for workers? And in and per, and particular case, what kinds of benefits would you want to throw into the mix? What kinds of institutions do you want to make sure we hit on in this conversation? so that we're, we've got it all covered as we're building together this new 21st century set of benefits. Yeah, so one of my better parts of the job when I was at the Department of Labor was I got to represent the US to the ILO. And the ILO, while I was there, worked very hard on developing a um, convention on social protection floors. Uh, so it was fascinating that the rest of the world determined that citizenship should in, involve, should, should grant people a social contract in which um, there was a social protection floor. These were, even though there was the ILO, these weren't things necessarily tied to work. And uh, we all know in the US, we've been 
have, we've had this drilled into our heads many times. You know, the rest of the world thinks that health and access to um, health care actually goes with being a human, yeah. not, not with anything else. It's you're a human, and in order to live, you better be healthy. Um, it's as ironic as the United States also, you know, thinks that water is a private right and not necessarily a human right. So, um, so there, there is a different framework out there to consider what are the rights of citizenship? What are the obligations of the state? And there are some fundamental things like health. There are fundamental things like reproducing society. Um, my profession, economics, is way too dominated by men. And the idea of social production just isn't anything that we do because that's not typically what men do. And the models that men have come up with social production would make you scream out of the room. So to value social production is the other part of it. And so we don't think about the sustainability of society and market-driven solutions, of course, can't incorporate that very well. And to a large extent, actually make it worse because there are benefits that we don't have in the marketplace. It is a positive good to have good social reproduction. And we know as economists that if you don't properly price that, then you're going to get too little of it and we don't get enough of it. And then to me, the, the other thing is we in the U.S. decided that many things would go with work, but we carved out whole sections of work. That's right. And to this day, we are dealing with that struggle. We said service sector workers, for the most part, are excluded. Definitely personal care workers are excluded. Right. And agricultural workers are excluded. This had real racial implications by design. And, and that's part economist again, because the economists who dreamed up all of this stuff explicitly did not want it to go to certain people. They were eugenicists. And they thought that if you made everybody better off, you made society worse off because you made more of these people that they thought were defective. Yeah. So, so the fact that black people were being excluded was not a mistake on their part. They never included black people in their concept of what would be good about these sorts of programs. Yeah. So in, in this century, we lost 3 million manufacturing jobs. We gained 3 million restaurant jobs. And those restaurant workers were never meant to be included in unemployment insurance. They really weren't included in social security except marginally. Uh, we didn't view them as being part of the system. A lot of these workers were excluded from the right to collectively bargain. So a lot of the things that we think about, like portability, well, that really is covered by unions when you think about construction workers or yeah. high workers with portable benefits, miners who, coal miners who have multi-employer agreements, and the ultimate gig workers. The members of the FLCIO include musicians, they include actors, they include the technical workers who are the actual original gig workers. Um, their unions benef write benefit agreements that make the profitability of those industries sustain all their members when it comes to health and retirement. So we have models that speak to the people we wanted to have benefits we still have not fully integrated those we didn't want to integrate. Yeah. And we haven't come up to speed, from my perspective with the rest of the world, on the notion of, you know, what is a society supposed to do? Yeah, those are critical questions you bring in. It, um, the parallel in some of our other work that we do at the financial security program that I think about is, um, you know, the GI Bill was enormously successful. It did everything it was supposed to do, but it also purposefully excluded a whole set of folks. But if we reimagined what is the GI Bill 2.0 that is inclusive, could we, you know, what's the next middle class we could build that included um, black and brown people and other people of color? And similarly, this just the way you're talking right now makes me think again back to my original challenge of 
let's be creative, imaginative, based in data, and um, you know, have the kind of mission and values that are inclusive. What is, what is the 2.0 of that, that we know works but can really work for everyone? I think the other thing that I wanna pull in that, uh, or pull out that Bill mentioned, which is critical to this conversation, um, which I think Trent and Molly, you brought in different kinds of institutions that intervene is what is the changing role of government here? And in Benefits 21, one of the things we're trying to do is say, okay, first, what is evidence and people themselves tell us about the right mix of benefits that bring economic dignity and financial security with work? And then who are the right institutions to offer them? And let's you know, shake our notions of what happened before and try to think of the worker first and what they need and then match institution to them. So um, important to think about what do other countries do with their different institutions and the roles they play and what are we willing to do as a country in the US? Prague, you've been sitting quietly, which is rare for Prague because he has much to say around these topics and shame on me for not pulling you in earlier. What are we missing so far in the mix here? Yeah, th thanks, Joanna. And thank you all for joining this conversation. You know, eight years ago, Bill and I were working together in the Labor Department. And we used to refer to ourselves not as the Department of Labor, but as the Department of Good Jobs for Everyone. And when you take a step back and you define what is a good job, it's a job that has a fair and living wage. It's a job that has worker empowerment, where the worker feels like they have control over their destiny. It's a workplace that is safe, um, both in terms of you know, health and safety regulations, but also a place where you can bring your whole self to work and not worry about being terrorized or bullied. It's a workplace that's diverse and that looks like the communities in which the work operates. But one of the important parts of a good job is that it provides you with that financial security and economic mobility, right? We want workers today, whether they are in nine to five jobs or they're doing part-time work, independent gig, freelance work, we want workers to feel a sense of financial security and economic mobility. And in that conversation, benefits is incredibly important. Yeah. And I think what's been missing from the conversation so far that I would add here is to remind people that the system we have right now has not always been around. You know, sometimes we just accept as a default that it's always been like this, that you get what your from the government, you get your paid leave from your employer, you get your unemployment insurance from the state government. It's not always been like this. The system we have today was really a byproduct of the Great Depression era. And it was some of the reforms of the New Deal. And it was important at that time. Here we are nearly a century later, and things have changed. The nature of work has changed. The challenges going forward have changed. And therefore, the benefit system itself should change. And so where MasterCard comes into this conversation is for four years, we at the Center for Inclusive Growth have been talking to workers on the front lines of these issues. And they've said what they really want most is they want more control over their finances. And one of the ways to get that for them is by divorcing benefits from the employer-employee relationship and even from your geographic location. So that as you move from job to job and place to place, your benefits should move with you. So Parag just said he thinks the thing that needs to come out of this, like the next big shift in our country needs to be around divorcing benefits from the employer and rethinking the, the roles of institutions and then the, the flexibility and freedom for employees. I'm paraphrasing you, Parag, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Molly, what do you think is when you work with the employers, the manufacturers in North Carolina that you're with, what do you think is the the positive that could come out of this disruption? Like what's the next big shift that we should be seeing around benefits and worker financial security? Sure, so that's a great question. And one thing we've really been thinking about because we do tend to work more with small producers. So we have this idea of, you know, being big by being small together. And a lot of what we're advocating and building to are these really trade associations that have power collectively. Um, so I think there's this kind of interesting parallel between working with small businesses, because one thing we're really interested in is that these contractual relationships for work aren't necessarily always directed just to one employer, but actually work as a group. And so, for example, one of the things we have done during the pandemic with the Carolina Textile District, which is allowing for benefits for the small businesses to come in collectively, and also therefore benefits for the employees to come in collectively, is we've been able to aggregate work during the pandemic and keep more than 60 companies working. So this was time when there was work shut down. A lot of them couldn't pivot quick enough, but because the Federation could pivot, we were able to get work to people. And yeah. so I think just instead of this kind of 
the, the marketplace also needs to shift so that there's more flexibility. So instead of just a small producer needing to be out, out there gathering work, almost similar to, to an, employee, an employee having to go into the marketplace in kind of a scary way, I think there's this really interesting opportunity now for small producers to aggregate more of their work. And we're doing the same thing for benefits too. That's how we were able to collectively get COVID testing for all of our, our network was to go in together and build our power. What, you know, a union here, if we, if in the absence of that, I mean, I'm really excited to see more unionization starting to happen in North Carolina, but in the absence of that, the ability for us to aggregate not only the benefits for our employees, but yeah. the benefits and the work into our small producers. And that's one thing that I think has allowed us to survive. And even through our trade benefit um, association, we were able to, for producers to keep their doors open, pay out $2 million during this time when a lot of people were shutting down. And so I think that's a really important for the small producer is their understanding of even how do they bring in work during a time that's incredibly unsettling. Well, what's, what that makes me think of, Molly, um, when we're in the, also sort of the throwing in of other kinds of benefits that may be things we didn't think about in the benefits category, one is predictable work and scheduling mm -hmm. in and income frankly. And so one of the benefits, lowercase b, I don't want to like trigger Arissa and all the lawyers out there watching this right now, um, but one of the lowercase b benefits that also you guys, it sounds like kind of brought together was work as a benefit. You know, actually, yes, you know, and even workers move. Work. Yes, yeah. yeah, we had workers moving, you know, because of, because of that. So I think yeah. it is the, the portability of work because we were organized as a federation. And I just really want to also lift up our small businesses have been able to get um, benefits for our employees. Um, again, in that bridge of, you know, we're dreaming about what it's going to be, but just yeah. to be sure we're making these high quality, good jobs now, we are members of the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. And that's how, because we're bigger, we're members of a much bigger pool, that's how we're able to pull down very strong benefits. Some of those portable and some of those just directly associated with each yeah. workplace. Trent, what, what is the disruptive thing that you think, again, for good, we're looking for disruption for good uh, in the same way that, you know, the Great Depression brought some disruption for good too, um, that you're hearing from your folks, you know, from 1099 world, like what would be a good outcome, a dream we could fulfill around benefits for them? Sure. I think I'd actually um, echo something we just talked about, which is I think the, the hope for any job, let alone the gig economy or independent work or running and owning your own small business is, is really at the end of the day to get uh, income security, to know where your next paycheck is coming from. So I think the, the, the lens I guess I'm looking through is, you know, what matters in the end is that we're increasing net incomes for the American worker, including the American independent worker. And the thing that I think really eats into that net income uh, is the fact that independent workers in particular have to go out and find their own benefits. And so I think in some ways, if we did adopt a system that is predominantly non-employer plans, that actually puts both the independent worker, the 1099er, on the same, uh, in, kind of in the same world as the W-2 employee. And I, but I am beginning to see, even among, I guess, proposals here in California by some of the larger gig economy platforms, is kind of this recognition of, of I think, really the reality that even if they are a different type of classification of worker, there's probably some responsibility uh, some imperative for the platform to contribute something, even if they're not going to provide benefits directly. And so I think what's interesting is the concept in the future um, will be common for both 1099 and W-2, where maybe the, you don't procure your benefits through your employer, but maybe your employer is the one that's helping contribute towards your own individual plan. Yeah, so they're contributing towards the well-being, but if you're thinking about what is their highest and best use, is it to um, run a healthcare plan or a small loan program or, you know, whatever retirement plan or is their highest and best use to fund it. And then we find a central actor who has the technical skills to do it. That, that would be the question going forward, right? Absolutely. Whether it's a platform or competition among platformer, pl platforms for independent workers or competition among uh, employers for that regular employee, it, it might in the future not be a question of do you offer this benefit? Can I access that benefit? Maybe it's a question of, will my employer help me pay for it? Yeah, like what percentage are you going to contribute towards that? Bill, that makes me think of where does the government fit into all of this, federal or state? What, what is your disruptive post-COVID dream for how you would see a new role for government in really ensuring economic dignity for workers around benefits? 
Well, I'm in a mixed seat because the the problem is the well has been so poisoned in the United States mm -hmm. against the public provision of human rights that you have lots of labor unions that do not like the idea of public provision because their understanding of the United States is people hate the government so much, this is such a powerful argument, that if it were government provided health care, it could not be adequate. Because the push would be, by definition, it shouldn't be. The government should not actually do some good. And there's a disbelief the government could. And so they do not have faith that if you said you're going to do public health provision, that they would get their benefits, which are very good, which are designed actually so you get to live. Uh, the, and so when they hear Medicare for all, they hear their current fear, which is I'm doing well now, but when I retire, I know good luck because they, their sense of it is Medicare has to have something else. Fortunately for them, in many cases, they have negotiated retirement health that can piggyback on the Medicare, but they fear only having Medicare. So, so part of this is the people who should be the champions for everybody should have my health care aren't because they don't believe the other side is willing to actually pony up. And this crisis has made clear that, that, that the current system is really, really difficult. Workers have now been out for over six months. We have a provision, COBRA, that allows workers to pay in their share of continuing their health coverage. At six months, workers cannot afford that. But the reality is they can't afford it at, at two weeks, except if they have some liquidity. And, and so at this moment, just as with the Great Depression, you would think everybody would wake up and go, you know what? If you're going to say I have to have an employer and 20 million people just lost an employer, this is not working out. Can we yeah. rethink this one? Yeah. And, um, and, and it's in the middle of a pandemic. Yes. So it, it, is, it, it isn't as if this is, we lost health insurance and, oh, well, you know, I'll live for six months. Right. So this is um, an amazing moment when, as Parag said, you can question, did we understand everything we should have during the Great Depression? Did we get everything right? Yeah. Maybe this is one of those things we didn't get right. I, I think this is the prime moment when people should see that tying healthcare to work is too complicated to solve. And as you've heard from the discussion here, it actually inhibits our creativity because there are, are, we are entering a world in which we claim we want people to be inventive and this is you know the fourth industrial revolution. But if you go out on the limb to start a company, then you're on the limb. <laughs> That's right. You, you can't because you that. have nothing. Yeah. You, you have absolutely positively nothing. And yeah. so it, it inhibits that. It means that if I were to start a company, I have to confront this as a market barrier. So it's amazing to me that you don't have the people on the far right who are libertarians to the extreme not saying this hurts business dynamics. And unfortunately, we have the people on the far left who, who, who benefit because of the way we structure who gets benefits, who gets to bargain, who doesn't get to bargain, and they love their benefits and they're, they're afraid of meeting the people on the far right. 
Yeah. So, so the well, people in the middle, the people in the middle, unfortunately, are the people who don't get to. Um, we don't have either of those. Yeah. I'd be curious what are some other tensions and in institutions that we have to be really mindful of and think about in how we work on this over the next couple of years as Benefits 21. Obviously, right now, and so many times in this conversation, not only this one, but I know in the advisory group, it is the, the crux of healthcare, which is where we are. And in a small rural community like ours, it's always the hospital systems and the adjacent satellite clinics. Um, and then I think, you know, to Bill's point of um, like being out on a limb, maybe that's why I was leaning in because I'm starting small businesses and chronically feeling out on the limb and encouraging other people to do so. And then yeah. that tension of you want people to be entrepreneurial. We know that's where a lot of the growth in the market is, even in manufacturing, what you think of are these giant plants and a lot of the growth in manufacturing are in these small, innovative, very nimble niche markets, um, which is where we are seeing the growth. I think what we've been... Um, again, using our network is also that bridge between when people can come into an employer relationship, you know, there's kind of the 90 days or whatever it, has, it needs to be when an employer can work with an employee is to find some really creative things to do. So for example, we've done, been able to do kind of a membership at our urgent care clinic until people can come into being formally introduced into benefits. And I think that's where we need to think very large and broad. And we also need to, I think, learn from local solutions where people have found solutions and either sh tell those stories so that those can be broadcast or formalize those stories and replicate them. But that is one opportunity that we found in, in this time. And so I think those healthcare institutions, particularly where they're reaching people, um, and again, I want to always lift up the rural communities, is I think a real tension for how folks can interface um, with, um, with workers. Yeah. I, I want to just add that I think that there's a lack of vision here, right? So much of what we're trying to do on reform is incrementalism. But what we're talking about with portable benefits is rethinking the whole system. And so two pieces of that that I would pull on from both what Trent said and what Bill said, you know, Trent talks about having a system of benefits for independent and contract workers, but he rightfully recognizes that we W-2 workers need this too. I've had 16 jobs in the last 20 years. Every time I change jobs, whether it's from private sector to government to nonprofit, I have to start all over again, accruing yeah. paid leave, uh, signing up for health insurance programs. Why do we have a system like that? That doesn't actually suit the worker, whether you're a W-2 or an independent. We need a universal system because one thing we know from the history of our country is when you create a niche system for one group, then you risk that system not having popular support. The reason why Social Security worked as well as it did, even though Republicans in the Congress lambasted it back in 1933, is because everybody got it. Rich, poor, old, young, everybody bait into it, everybody got it, and it was for everyone. And so that has helped keep it sailing all these years. So I think universality is one piece. But Bill also points out another good point, which is the lack of trust in government has much to do with the fact that we haven't modernized the benefit system in the government. I had to apply for unemployment insurance in Washington, D.C. many years ago, and I'm shocked to find out that they still use Excel spreadsheets in the D.C. government to manage unemployment insurance. The whole paper process by which every two weeks I had to apply for the benefit and tell you what job searches I had done, that's insane. A few years later, they made it mobile friendly, but it still wasn't user friendly. So I think we have to think about how do we digitize these benefits so that the user, the worker is at the center and it's made friendly to them. And when you put these things together, you recognize what we need is a universally accessible and interoperable technology. I should be able to manage all of my benefits, whether they're government provided, employer provided, I should be able to manage them all on my own digital platforms. It should be managed on my cell phone. It should be that convenient, that easy. Um, and then we can talk about transferring to a portable benefit system. But this is the bigger vision we need to have. So you're even saying pre-portable is, um, can we even just upgrade to the technology that exists in 2020 as we see it, right? Well, interoperable is the predecessor to portable. Yes. Yeah, that makes total sense. Trent, did you have something to add here on tensions you're seeing or what's going to be hard to move this forward if we're just being real? Like if we're truth talking to everyone watching right now as people who are experts in the field, what's the hard part about this right now? Well, I think one really difficult thing um, that you usually are solving for in, in technology or software experiences is the behavioral uh, science concept of, of opt-in versus opt-out. So. I think like if you look at social security, that does really feel like an opt-out. 
in the sense that it's going to apply to everyone. They're going to get it. There's systems in place, there's processes that will guide you through your working life and it will be there for you. Um, I think the nature of benefits today is really an opt-in. Even for the, those W-2 employees when they're selecting their benefits, trying to figure out you know, what, you know, what is enough, what can I afford, how will the employer help, help me, and again, for the independent worker, they're all on their own. I think that the, the, no, no matter if it's a government solution, a private market solution, or, or most likely in the, in the foreseeable future, a mix, I think that building systems in terms of opt-outs makes more sense. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, um, we started doing this work a couple of years ago and really thinking about the, what parts of work bring financial security beyond just income. You know, I think when I would say to friends of mine, you know, you don't, like you get paid fine, but you don't get paid enough. Like you, your life works because of your series of benefits surrounding you. And they were sort of like, that's true. I'm like, well, sure. Like n none of us are meant to be paid everything we need. We get it through a series of benefits. And to your point that you could opt out of things that are actually part of what makes you whole economically doesn't make a ton of sense, but we create all these barriers to like fully embracing and being part of it. Um, all right, I have to wrap this up, which is a shame because I have so many things, so many more things that I need to say to you all and talk to you about and ask you about, um, but we have our leadership advisory group meetings for that. and. I urge everyone who wants to keep on talking about this with us and engaging with us about it to check out the Aspen Institute's website. We have a Benefits 21 page. We have a page that discusses our partnership with MasterCard that's been essential to the work that we've been doing here. Um, we have four kind of principles, guiding principles for what we're doing with Benefits 21 um, that we believe will really modernize it in a way that, that has a substantive positive impact for workers in this country. And it's that this work is people-centric, it's inclusive, it's portable, and it's interoperable. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you about one of them and to give me a something really positive, something that gives you hope in that particular guiding principle. Um, so for Bill, what people-centric, I want to ask you about this. What, what is happening now that we can build off of that's giving you hope that people-centric is a a value that we can drive through all of this work and that that guiding principle can exist as modernized benefits. The thing that shocked me the most in the CARES Act was uh, putting in place paid sick days. And I was shocked because this has normally been a touchstone uh, of the far right that workers aren't entitled to this. But the American people <laughs> Uh, quickly saw the wisdom of that and for all the parents who were stuck at home with their children to understand that there would be a benefit for the parent, normally the wife, to pay attention to the children while she was stuck at home. And so to me that was the most encouraging was finally I think we may have hit the consensus that the government ought to make sure that people have paid sick days and that they be flexible enough that we incorporate care. So the way the bill was written, it could be that you had to stay home because your children's school was closed or because a family member was sick and had to be cared for. And I'm hoping we can build off of that and we won't have to relitigate this. Moving forward, we will accept that if you or your family members are, are sick, this is something that society has to have. Maybe, maybe we will build on that because we are again the only industrialized nation that doesn't recognize paid paternity leave. And with the decline in birth rate and the tremendous loss in life that we have endured because of this virus, and because we've had a president who's shaken anybody's desire to want to immigrate to the United States. So, so we're not making up ground through immigration for continued population growth. Maybe we will finally join the rest of the world and see that you have to have some sort of paid leave for care. 
both at the beginning of life with children and at the end of life yeah. with, with yeah. those Our older families. Older, yeah. and, and because of what we saw happen to the elderly, the tremendous loss of life we saw yeah. in our care of Beginning of the pandemic. There are, lots of families. there are lots of families who are still crying and grieving yeah. because their jobs didn't allow them to have their parent at home with them. And they know that their parent would have been alive today. Right, if they could have taken them. That's absolutely right. Molly, I'm going to ask you about the inclusive, equitable part of our um, guiding principles in thinking about employers, you know, as the folks that you work closest with. Um, any bright spots, bright stars, shining moments happening right now that give you hope about inclusivity as it relates to employers or just what you're seeing in the world? Sure, I appreciate the, the final question to be expansive and um, forward thinking and hopeful. I think yeah. we're often caught in this moment of, you know, to Parag's point, being incrementalist. So I appreciate you pushing us to be forward um, and, and dreaming bigger as we also deal with the reality of the moment right now. Um, so I think so much of what's come at this conversation is that person that is self-employed to one person, um, to that person that's a plan of five, to that person that's a plan of 50, to that person that often identifies as the employer and the employee, to that person that speaks multiple languages, has multiple identities, maybe even challenged with um, immigration status. So I think that whole inclusivity of urban and rural really needs to um, be, be part of the opportunity that we lift forward. And yeah. so I think um, that really is the, the world we need to see, the world we need to embrace, and it needs to be also reflected both in the, in the benefits as well. So, and again, just lifting up that opportunity for employee, smaller employees to come together to really secure, as we've talked about, the benefits need to stand on the back of just good work and opportunity and localized productivity um, as the backbone of the security of work. So I think all of this needs to be built on the backbone of the security of work. And so helping to secure that small, con small, and small producers have contracts is really important so that, that anything moving forward in terms of benefits can be you know, undergirded by the security of a strong foundation of a paycheck every week. So. Trent, I'm gonna ask you for some spotlights around portability happening in the country world right now that give you hope for, again, the kind of future of modernized benefits we need to build. Sure, so I think um, what is interesting, and again, I'm, I'm coming from more of a, a, a technology and Silicon Valley perspective. I think I can talk about what we're getting right and where I think we can improve. I think what we're starting to get right is that there is actually consumer level interest in some of these portable benefits because they've, you know, we're creating the, the experience that these are almost like products. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to call them luxuries, but you know, in many times they're, they're not necessarily afforded for everybody. Um, so I think that's, that's the area that we need to, to actually get right. So I do hope that uh, government, um, even down to uh, tax policy and in particular, the deductibility of these benefits, depending on if it's employer paid or non-employer paid and employee paid. I think that that is, it, it, you know, it really is, I think the market's opportunity to create the product that will respond to government policy around the benefit of the deductibility from tax. And Leslie Parag, um, the interoperability, you brought it up, I needed to bring it back to you. Do we have any, that is essential, as you said, in any imagination we have about uh, future of benefits in this country that really allows for economic dignity for workers. Um, where do, anything happening with interoperability we can build off of, things that say to you, we're gonna get there and we're gonna build off of it this way. Yeah, I think there's great examples right now, like what Trent is doing at TRAC and um, what other FinTechs have created. Um, you look at the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the project they have right now with ALIA, a benefit system for domestic workers where they've worked with the city of Philadelphia government to combine uh, or join forces in order to provide uh, paid time off to these workers. But the way I think about interoperability, because it's, it's an industry term, is think back to when we were kids, right? In the 1990s when you would lose the remote control and it was like the bane of your existence. Yeah. And then somebody came up with the bright idea of creating the universal remote control, that it would work with any television device, any brand, and then they figured out that, oh, there's a way to connect your remote control to not only the TV, but the TV and the VCR all on one device. <laughs> and then it was the TV, the VCR, the DVD, then the Blu-ray player. 
suddenly we had this idea of one device to rule them all. It's very Lord of the Rings, right? One ring to rule them all. Lord of the Rings, yeah. That's how I think of portable benefits, is one system to rule them all, but interoperable so that we can take what exists, bring it all into one platform, and then eventually get ourselves, as other countries are starting to do, to a place where we have a seamless set of benefits, and the worker gets to choose what benefits they need at a given time in their life. And it could be health insurance, as Bill has talked about, or paid leave, as he mentioned, uh, and parental leave, but it could also be um, education and skilling. It could be personal finance. Um, whatever the needs are of the workers, your benefit system is an enabler. It enables you to do your best work. That's good for the worker and it's good for the employer. I love that your bright light that we're building off of is a 1990s technology of a universal remote. Um, I'm just joking, the National Domestic Workers Alliance work is quite phenomenal for those of you that are not familiar with it and you should absolutely check it out. All right, I'm sad. I have to say goodbye to you guys or until we next meet. Um, Bill, Parag, Trent, and Molly, this was, again, a fascinating just like to start. I feel like we dug deep a little but have so much more to say. I'm so thrilled that everyone could join us for this conversation. As I mentioned, you're about to see all the websites and listservs you can join to not just learn more, but to engage with us, be leaders alongside of us, imagine the world you want to see, and then let's do something about it together. Um, we have great ambitions for this work, not because of ego or because we think it's fun, but because people's lives depend on it. And um, people in our community are working their tails off and it's not bringing them the economic dignity or financial security they deserve. And we have to do something about it. So do something with us. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you again to all my amazing panelists for today, but also really for the work you're doing in this country. So appreciative. Take care, everyone. Thank you.